Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Healthcare for the Homeless Benchmarking, 2016 Uniform Data System Summary and UDS Mapper Review. I am Elena Boyer and I will be the moderator for the webinar presented by the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council with support from the Health Resources and Services Administration and the Borough of Primary Healthcare. This is a 60-minute presentation with the last 10 minutes reserved for Q&A. There is a chat box below the presentation slides for participant questions and technical issues. Please type your questions or technical issues into the chat box at any time during the presentation. A select number of questions will be answered at the end of the presentation during the Q&A session. Remaining questions will be logged and provided to the presenter for written responses after the webinar. If you are having technical issues, you may also call the Council's office at 615-226-2292 for any assistance. Our speakers today are Brett Poe, who is a research associate at the National Healthcare for the Homeless Council, who joined the research team um, here at the Council in November 2016. Brett supports the Healthcare for the Homeless field by developing and disseminating knowledge, increasing visibility of HCH-related research through publications and external collaborations, and providing data-driven support to interdepartmental teams and work groups. Today, he will be sharing pieces of his UDS publication that will re be released soon. Prior to his work at the Council, Brett worked as Program co Coordinator and managed a longitudinal quality improvement database at Vanderbilt University and Meharry Medical College. Brett earned his degree in mass communications with focus in journalism from the Middle Tennessee State University. We are also to have happy to have with us today Dr. Jennifer Rankin, who is the Senior Manager for Research and Pro Product Services at Health Landscape. Prior to this, she served as the geospatial Informatics Senior Analyst, an, an, Analyst for the Robert Graham Center. She directs all geospatial projects for Health Landscape, most notably UES Mapper. Her career has focused on issues related to primary care and access to care with a special interest in geography of access to health care. She has worked with HRSA Maternal and Child Health Bureau, the Texas Association of Community Health Centers, and the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Jennifer earned her Master's of Health Administration from the Tulane School of Public Health and Tropical Medicine, as well as her Master's of Science in Health Information Sciences, and a Master's of Public Health and PhD in Public Health Informatics from the University of Texas Health Science Center at Houston. So thank you both for being here. Um, and on that note, I will hand it over to the presenters. Great, thank you so much, Elena, and good morning to everybody. Um, we hope that today's webinar is going to be useful for everybody and provide some context in uh, how to get the most out of our data. Um, and our objectives for today are to understand how the UDS can be used to benchmark best practices based on the data analysis of similar, similarly uh, composed HCH grantees. Um, also to utilize the UDS to demonstrate the value and the impact provided by our HCH programs um, to their populations that are served. Um, and also from Jennifer to uh, use the UDS mapper and its available functions and data um, and all of its other potential uses. So to meet these objectives today, um, our agenda, thank you, Elena, again for our introductions. Um, I will be spending um, roughly about the first 15 or 20 minutes um, just to provide an overview of the UDS data that was reported for 2016 um, and our benchmarking that we've been able to provide through our technical assistance to our grantees. Um, and then for the second half of the presentation, Jennifer will again go over um, her material for the UDS mapper. And as Elena said, we will uh, save some time at the end for any um, questions that the group may have. And at any time, if anybody has any questions um, about what we're presenting, feel free to uh, also put that into the Q&A pod through your uh, web room. Um, so just a kind of overview of what I'll be talking about for my portion today. I'm going to provide a little bit of background on just what the UDS is um, and how we can use that data. I'm going to provide kind of a summary of the profile of our HCH grantees and their composition, um, the quality of care measures that are reported, um, how our grantees um, rank amongst each other in terms of productivity, 
um, and then also draw some conclusions on the impact that's demonstrated through what we provide um, and how we can continue to strengthen our data collection. So most of you are probably already very familiar with the UDS if you're uh, calling in here today, but the UDS is um, a standardized reporting system. It's the uniform data system um, that is used to report um, from those that are funded through uh, health resources and service administration and allows us to provide consistent performance measures and information about our uh, grantees and their lookalikes that are funded under Section 330 of the Public Health Services Act. Uh, and then what is included in the UDS, there's more than 900 variables that are included in an aggregated data set, and it's going to focus on um, the core set of data that includes patient demographics and services provided by health centers, um, select clinical indicators, utilization rates, costs, revenues. Um, the data set does include more than 900 variables across all of our 330 funded health centers. And the UDS is collected annually and recorded based on uh, the four 330 health center funding streams. And those funding streams are indicated here. Um, so 330E are our um, general community health centers that serve the more general underserved population. Um, and you can see the breakdown here of 330G, H, and I, which serve our more targeted um, or special populations. Um, so our report is going to try to look at those 900 variables and uh, pare them down to summarize how the UDS data that was reported in 2016 can be used um, from NCA, such as the uh, Healthcare for the Homeless Council, to provide technical assistance, or TA, um, to our 330H grantees and their lookalikes to establish benchmarks, identify needs, and prioritize new programs, demonstrate the value and the impact of our grantees, um, and the overall HCH program, and provide the ability to deliver tailored and targeted training and technical assistance. So data from 2016 uh, that was reported to HRSA was made available to the Council in August of last year. Uh, and so since that time, uh, we've received about 236 TA requests that were submitted to the Council, um, and excluding those that were um, specifically uh, asking for individual needs, about 28% of those requests that we received were related to data that is available um, to find in the UDS. Um, and so then of those, we have a general breakdown of topics uh, that most of our requests that relate to demonstrating HCH grantee demographic profiles or staffing and quality benchmarking. Um, and that's what you can see in this um, pie breakdown. Um, so these areas are where we receive the most common TA requests, and they'll be summarized in the coming slides on uh, a national scale in the sections that follow. Um, and so these areas are what we use to determine how best to break down those 900 variables and digest that information into something that we hope will be most useful for our grantees. So again, looking at the um, universal data set, that includes data from almost 1,400 reporting health centers across all funding streams. Uh, again, that's uh, across all combinations of the 330 E, G, H, and I. Um, those health centers report aggregated data representing nearly 25.9 million patients. Uh, and comparatively, uh, our 330 H programs um, represent 295 health centers um, that see 9,174 patients. Um, so the purpose of this following section is going to uh, just visualize some of the benchmarks that are specific to HCH grantees and the populations that we serve compared to the more generalized health center population. So looking at funding type, this slide um, demonstrates uh, how that funding is dispersed across grantees. Um, regardless of any other type of 330 funding that they may receive. Um, so really what we're seeing here is just how those fundings can be paired. Um, and we have a list here, again, of, uh, of what those particular funding streams are um, and how they can be combined. So it should be noted uh, that HCH or 330H health centers um, can exist as clinics and large uh, that are part of larger community health center systems or public health departments, or they can exist as freestanding clinics. Um, and those are what we would call our standalone clinics. So we have 63 HCHs uh, that exist outside of community health centers, 
um, and that can be paired by any of the, the groupings of our special populations. Um, 55 of that 63 only receive 330H funding. So those are some distinctions that we'll be making as we look at some of this data um, just for consistency uh, in, in the reporting and so you know exactly which groups we're talking about when we make these comparisons. Um, so looking at the housing status as that compares from our 330H populations to the general populations, um, health centers do report in the UDS the total number of patients that are experiencing homelessness and their housing status. Um, with HCH grantees collecting this information in greater detail. Um, and that's what you see there on the right, the, the specific housing status. Um, so this data can be of great value to us to understand the relationship between homelessness and health care um, to a variety of indicators and can inform our health center practices. Um, so when comparing HCH program data to the universal data set, we can um, consider here that the housing status data is not reported consistently across health centers. Um, this is a required variable to be reported by 330H grantees, but it is not required by all of the funding streams. Um, so even with that being said, though, it is noteworthy um, that considering that non-HCH grantees may be underreporting, we still see here that uh, 295 health centers out of more than 1,300 account for 70% of all patients seen experiencing homelessness. And that just highlights the substantial impact that these programs have on the population that we serve. Uh, so similarly then here, um, we see the highlights of the amount of patients that are seen by HCH grantees that live at or below federal poverty level, um, which is 71% living below poverty level versus uh, of our HCH grantees versus 48% of those seen by non-HCH grantees. Uh, and then finally, in terms of composition, we can also consider the payer mix that's reported among our grantees. Um, so this figure shows that while the mix of those that are insured by Medicare and Medicaid is relatively comparable, there is an unsurprising but significant difference in uh, uninsured patients seen across the health centers. So 24% versus those seen by HCH grantees, 36% uh, that are uninsured. So the collection of quality of care measures in the UDS was added in 2008 in order to track the improvement of population health uh, with regard to acute and chronic conditions. Um, these measures indicate steps that are either taken toward treatment or better management with preventative measures, um, things like prenatal visits, immunizations, cancer screenings, um, and also in linkage to care um, and variables such as HIV treatment or behavioral health services. We're going to unpack some of what's going on on uh, this slide here for you in Table 1. This table shows the amount of HCH grantee sites um, that were uh, measured by HRSA into quartiles that appropriately link patients to care across 15 indicators. Uh, and again, these quartiles were set um, by HRSA and then they uh, applied rankings um, of quartiles in terms of um, performance in linkage to care. I mean, what we have highlighted in green are um, rows where our HCH grantees are performing higher in the second quartile than those that were reported across the universal set. Uh, also, as of 2016, a new variable has been added to the UDS that informs health information technologies, or HIT, capacity. Um, and of our 255 338 reporting health centers, 40% uh, of those utilize telehealth or the provision of remote health care. Um, and as this continues to be tracked, the variable will be useful in demonstrating the increased capacity of grantees to provide and link patients to quality care and the manner in which they can provide these additional services. Uh, one of the most common TA requests that we receive here at the Council um, relates to staffing and productivity benchmarking of various services that are provided by um, either similarly composed health centers, um, those uh, that may want to compare themselves based on their standalone status or by their region. Um, and high health center sites might request this data to demonstrate where their programs fall in relation to other health centers of uh, similar patient size. Um, and then we can compare personnel productivity by the patients that are seen per month by each FTE personnel. So 
So again, we'll um, kind of unpack everything that's going on here. Um, to identify 330H only patient population comparators, uh, the data was grouped into 10 different bins. Um, these were evenly distributing the number of the grantees by the volume of patients served. Um, so this is uh, the, the denominator here is our 55 standalone 330H only funded groups. Um, and the parameters then are, are defined by the upper and lower limits that are um, present after the even distribution. So each bin that you're seeing in uh, these rows represent about five to six grantees represented in each bin. Um, we do have a slightly larger number of clinics here in, the, um, in bin 10 um, because of the wider range at those higher capacities. Uh, and then using formulas that we received from Capital Link, um, productivity then is measured by the total visits for any particular staffing area. Uh, and then those total visits divided by the total annual FTE um, that are staffed under that area um, and then divided by 12 for their monthly productivity. Um, so for sites that want to use these as their own comparators, we have the summary of staffing productivity here in this table too um, based on these brackets that were just described. So unsurprisingly, uh, you can see that higher clinic sizes see more patients per physician than those that are of a, a smaller patient size. And then we can also compare that to the average productivity measures uh, across all of the bins. Um, so again, it's important to distinguish that this data um, used for productivity reports is based only on our standalone grade grantees. Um, which again are those that are not located within a larger community health center um, as these are the uh, only sites within that extracted report that we can see that FTE for. Um, there's no consistency in any other reports that uh, that staffing is only funded by the 330H stream of funding. Um, so any health center programs that want to increase or decrease any of these parameters uh, of these patient sizes, um, or if you want a more in-depth breakdown of any of these um, staffing areas, we definitely um, invite and encourage you to reach out to us for a more in-depth breakdown of that, um, and we can provide more detailed technical assistance for you. Uh, so what we can conclude from the data that was reported in 2016 uh, is that this demonstrates uh, program impact and can be used as a basis for future program development. Um, these variables can help direct outreach efforts and multidisciplinary team approaches. Uh, and it's also invaluable for uh, those national cooperative agreements such as the council that provide technical assistance uh, when we are um, helping our grantees in benchmarking purposes or connecting health centers with similar services or similar characteristics that are showing success. Uh, and then we can connect our grantees to share best practices and come together and improve patient outcomes uh, more efficiently. Um, and so to do that, we want to make sure that our data collection is as strong as possible. Um, so using the data to provide insight into the utilization patterns, uh, major health concerns of our health center patients, um, and those that are pertinent to our particular populations, um, gives us a starting point then for deeper analysis on a, a local level. And the UDS data provides a lot of information, but it's impacted by the accuracy of the data collection, the accuracy of the reporting, and there's a continued need then to improve um, that collection in those reports. Hi, everyone. Um, I think they might be having um, a, an internet issue on their end, but this is Jennifer Rankin. Um, so let me go back on my slides. Um, as I said, this is Jennifer Rankin. I am the um, UDS Mapper Manager at Health Landscape. I'm happy to be with you all today. Um, the UDS Mapper, um, if you have not already heard about it, is an online mapping tool um, that provides a lot of information related specifically to the health centers. Um, I'm going to be referring to the health centers as a whole um, uh, as health center program grantees or HCP grantees. And when I do that, I'm referring to those um, grantee organizations that Brett was talking about earlier, um, 330E, G, H, and I collectively, um, plus the lookalike organizations. So 
So the UDS mapper takes the UDS data from those organizations um, and compares it to community and population data. And that allows us to look at the spatial relationships between the program, um, the communities that you're serving, and other uh, resources that are also serving the safety net. Oops. So when you're using the UDS mapper, you're going to be looking at a geography called zip code tabulation areas. They are an approximation of zip codes that the US Census Bureau creates. And the reason that we use those is because zip codes themselves are not a reliable geography. They can change any time the US Postal Service needs them to change. And um, ha having data uh, using a, a geography created by the Census Bureau means that we also have the population data that we need to compare our patient data to. In the UDS mapper, um, we use the most recent data available. Um, we're currently using the 2016 data. So um, you all, uh, everyone who is a grantee that's on the phone, your data were submitted on February 15th. They go to other contractors to clean and verify the data. Those contractors actually prepare the data set that we use in the UDS mapper. And those data are typically updated every summer. So we should see your 2017 data sometime in July or August. And then we use population data from a variety of sources. Um, as I said, we get data from the Census Bureau, but we also get data from CDC, specifically from their behavioral risk factor surveillance system. We get data from the HRSA area health resources file. Um, uh, so we pull data from a lot of different places to help supplement the patient data that we're seeing in the UDS mapper. When we are in the UDS mapper and we're using UDS data, it's important to keep some things in mind with the data. So in terms of the patient data, we're only pulling data from the UDS. So we only have data from those health center program grantees and lookalikes. We don't have any other safety net organization data. And keep in mind that organizations um, typically have much larger funding than just their federal funding. So um, even for those organizations that are reporting into the UDS, we're only getting the portion of their patients that are tied to the federal grant. We're only looking at ZICDAs. We can't look at any other geography. So we can't look at census tracts. We can't look at counties because ZICDAs cross those traditional geography borders all the time. Um, they even cross state lines occasionally. So we can't look at any other geography. Um, we're stuck at looking at ZICDAs because the patient data themselves are reported at the zip code level. Um, if there are 10 or fewer patients in, uh, reported by a health center, those patients are not going to be reported in the UDS mapper. So that's how you're told to report in the UDS itself. If you don't have at least 11 patients, do not report that zip code. So we follow that same rule. We also don't have any information specifically about low income um, at a zip code level. So even though health centers are reporting patients by income level, they're not reporting patients by income level by zip code. And therefore, any calculations that we're doing based on the patient information from the UDS, um, those are going to be estimates based on 100% of the patients being low income. Nationally, we know that about 92% of all health center patients have known income or low income. Um, so we're comfortable with that calculation. Um, but just be aware of that, um, that, that that is an estimate for that particular calculation. As I said before, you report on February 15th for the previous calendar year, so we can only look at that time period. And the data are reported at the organization level, so we can't look site by site. Um, I is a limitation. So here we are um, uh, also, as I said, looking at ZICDAs, and they involve uh, uh, zip codes uh, or include zip codes, but zip codes can change at any time, and so the ZICDAs are more stable. Those geographic boundaries just uh, change every 10 years. So we will have new ZICDA boundaries for the 2020 census. There are additional considerations to keep in mind when we're looking specifically at homeless data. 
Um, the data that we have on the population come from the American Community Survey from the U.S. Census Bureau. Um, so the ACS does not have a good methodology to count, account for homeless people. Therefore, in our population counts, um, the denominator in many of our calculations in the UDS mapper, it's going to probably um, represent an undercount of people living in a ZICTA. Also, the patient data from the UDS, um, we're going to be using the overall numbers and not numbers from any of the special population tables in the UDS. Um, so um, uh, keep that in mind. We're not uh, in the UDS mapper, we don't have a way to separate out homeless patients from other health center patients. We're looking at patients as a whole. And for those of you who are familiar with how the reporting happens for the UDS report, if a patient truly has no address to report, you're going to be using the health center address as the patient's address in, the, um, uh, in your patient registry system. So therefore, um, uh, patient counts, that our numerator in many of our calculations uh, may overrepresent people living in a ZICTA. So I'm going to have, according to the UDS, too many people living there. According to the ACS, not enough people living there. And so sometimes our calculations are going to look a little bit strange, especially around homeless health centers. So here we're looking at a map um, of Austin, Texas. Um, we're looking specifically at a penetration map. Penetration is the percent of the target population who are patients at any health center um, divided by, uh, so, so the percent of target popula uh, population. So total patients divided whatever my target population is. In this case, I'm looking at a penetration of the low income map. So I'm looking at total patients um, divided by number of low income people. We see right there in the center a very dark green, which as we can see from the legend means that greater than 80% of the low income people in that area are going to any health center organization. That is a very rare color to see on a UDS mapper penetration map. It does not happen that often except for West Virginia um, and some parts of um, the West. Um, but this dark color is an anomaly. So when you're in the UDS mapper and you're seeing this sort of dark green, the first question I ask if it's an urban area is, is this a place where there's a homeless health center? If it's not an urban area, I'm going to question it just because um, something else may be going on there in terms of um, migrant or seasonal farm workers, or we might have um, people of all income levels coming to a rural health center. But in an urban area, I'm always going to question what's going on here. And here we can see a specific number for that penetration rate in Austin, Texas. I see for 78701, there are 1,900 patients who report this, this address, which is downtown Austin. Um, which until recently was not a very residential area. Um, and so uh, having patients reported as living there uh, would be unusual. And we see that penetration rate is very high. It says 173% of the low-income people in this area are going to any health center organization. So I'm going to continue my sleuthing a little bit. Um, and as I said, if I was in a rural area, um, I would say, uh, do we have patients coming in from, from all income levels, um, not primarily low income? So in a rural area, the only provider of care will see people of all income levels, um, and the health centers are frequently that only provider of care. So you're going to have those spikes in penetration if I'm looking at the penetration of the low income population. Also the same for migrant and seasonal. Um, we're going to be using a patient's local address um, so again, inflating the patient number um, and not having enough people included in the denominator, so we'll have spikes in penetration. In urban areas, it may be homeless, but it may also be a seasonal population. So again, your local knowledge of what's going on in that area can sort of help you sleuth out what's going on and where those homeless patients are being counted in the UDS mapper. So the way that you could investigate is in the UDS mapper on the far right side of the screen, you'll see a tool that's called the Explore Service Area Tool, 
towards the bottom um, of that, I can turn on where there are health center administrative locations. Those are the larger dots that we see on the map. And then I can also turn on where services are provided. Those are the smaller dots that we see on the map. And you can put your mouse on top of those dots to see what's going on in that location. So we see a couple of blue dots within that dark green area on the map. And I'll see uh, when I put my mouse on top of it that this is Community Care Austin Resource Center for the Homeless. So yes, indeed, there is a homeless health center in this particular zip code in Austin, Texas. Um, often the name um, is obvious, and sometimes it's not as obvious as this particular example. Um, but it can help you um, find where those homeless health centers are, um, including where their, where their patients are being counted. So um, specifically in the UDS mapper, there are information cards which show you a lot of information about what's going on either in the area or for a particular organization or site. So what we see here are a couple of examples. Um, on the left, we see an information card for Zixta. Um, I can see for 78701 Austin, uh, I can see you know, how many people live there, how many are low income. So there's only 1,098 people officially counted as being low income in this particular Zixta. But there are 1,909 patients. And then I get my penetration rates for the total population and my penetration rate for the low income population. I can see that those 1,909 patients are actually going to three different organizations. They're going to Travis County Healthcare District, which um, is doing business as Community Care Austin, at Lone Star Circle of Care, and People's Community Clinic. So 93.9% .9 of all those 1,900 patients are going to Community Care. And I, uh, I can then get a sense for how many overall patients are in that particular Zikta for that particular grantee organization. There's a second information card that's available for the organizations. Um, so if I click on an organization, I'm going to get basic information. So Travis County Healthcare District, um, uh, I would see just basic address information. But there's a special population, um, excuse me, the, the, there's a special way to get additional UDS data about an organization out of the UDS mapper, and that's this information card deck. And if you can see, each of these uh, gray bars, if you click on it, will have additional information about a health center organization. And for this particular one, I can see right there in the middle that 4.19% of their patients are homeless patients. This is coming directly from their 2016 UDS report, um, and so that's where I can get that special population information about um, health centers. Um, I'm going to just go back one slide uh, just to show you how you would turn on that special information card. Um, when you're in the Explore Service Area tool, down towards the bottom where you turn on the health center administrative locations, right next to health center administrative locations, there's a little very faint gray tool that looks like a stack of cards. If you click that, and it turns green, when you click on one of those larger dots representing a health center administrative location, that's when you're going to get this enhanced information card deck that will give you all sorts of information about the health center that cannot be parsed out to the zip codes because they're not reported by zip code in the UDS report. So, um, so keep that in mind. There are, are some very specific ways to get some homeless information out of the UDS mapper. Otherwise, we're going to sort of have to sleuth it out to figure out where homeless health centers are um, and where their patients um, are being reported in the UDS. So I want to point out that um, there's a lot of help on the site. There are tutorials on the site. Um, we launched this version of the UDS mapper on January 2015, or January 25th of this year. Sorry, I don't know where that came from. So January 25th of this year, we launched the new UDS mapper, um, and it has uh, it's slowly being populated in terms of the um, tutorials that are available. But we do have our webinar slides up on there, and we're getting other uh, how-tos posted very soon. 
There's a searchable knowledge base. Um, we also have dedicated staff to answer um, user chats or emails. And we do offer regular webinars. So if you'd like to have a more in-depth um, uh, webinar about the general use of the UDS mapper, our next one of those is coming up on May 10th. Um, and so you can access all of those links here. And also in your uh, resources pod, uh, there's a link to the UDS mapper. And if you just click on tutorials um, and resources, you'll find all of this information on the UDS mapper site. So with that, um, I'd like to thank you. I think Brett is back on as well. Uh, yes, hopefully everybody can hear us now if we have corrected our audio issues. Yes, I can hear you. Perfect, great. Um, I believe that we only missed um, a little bit of the, the final um, conclusion slides. So if anybody has any particular uh, questions about those conclusions um, that wasn't um, summarized on the slide, please let me know and I'd be happy to, to go back and, and answer any of that for you. Uh, and also, I do want to clarify, um, thank you to Bobby for pointing this out. Um, there was a typo on our slides before. We said that there were uh, about 9,000 patients seen by our 295 uh, 330H grantees. Um, so if that raised any red flags for anybody, um, just to correct, that number is actually uh, more than 900,000, um, specifically 934, 174 patients. So thanks again to Bobby for pointing that out. Great. Um, hopefully everybody can hear me um, as well. This is the moderator, Elena Boyer. Um, so I want to thank you for presenting today, Brett and Dr. Rankin. This was an excellent snapshot of the great work Healthcare for the Homeless Health Center grantees provide and the care they bring to individuals and families experiencing homelessness and learning about the capabilities of UDS Mapper, um, which will be extremely useful to all health center programs. A link to the archived webinar and PowerPoint slides will be emailed to registrants within three business days. So now we'll open it up to questions um, for um, Brett and Dr. Rankin. And any questions that we do not get to um, or are unable to respond to will be addressed via email if possible. So there is um, one question that has come through. I believe this is for Dr. Rankin. Um, we have a question about, is there an easy way to export an analysis of a set of ZCTA in the service area into a CVS? or Excel file? So I just oh. uh, backed up in the slides. Um, so uh, if you can imagine uh, here in the UDS mapper, you would just click on some ZICTAs to select them. Um, you would have to decide which ZICTAs you're selecting. But once you have some ZICTAs selected, they'll also be listed over in the Explore Service Area tool in that selected ZICTAs box. And then down in the lower left corner, um, under where we see that information card currently, there's a little button that looks like a window or four squares. If you click on that, it will take you to a data table um, that you can then uh, look at visually. Uh, you can add columns to your data table and then export that as a comma-separated value or CSV file that you can then use in any spreadsheet program. So as long as you have Zicta selected uh, and then you go into the data table, you can export your data there. Great. Thank you, Dr. Rankin. Um, again, feel free to enter any questions you have in the chat, and we will get to them um, as soon as we can. Um, um, I, have, I have a question. Brett Poe, how often do we receive um, data from, the, um, from HRSA? Yeah, so the uh, data that HRSA provides to us is, is um, reported annually. Um, so we receive um, uh, through um, a data agreement with HRSA, we receive some of those tables that are not publicly available. Um, and those of you that are interested, those public tables um, are also linked in our um, UDS resources pod in the web room, so you can access that there. Um, but again, yeah, through our um, data use agreement with HRSA, we receive some of those additional tables uh, the summer of each year. Um, and then we go through and, and curate that data and extract um, our HDH grantee numbers to perform this um, secondary analysis annually. That's great. Thank you. Um, and Dr. Rankin, a really quick question for you. 
Um, do you um, have any top or most common questions that come in or how people use um, the UDS mapper? Is it mainly for new application processes, or is it just a mix of different types of um, uses? So the, the primary use is for um, service area mapping when you're making some sort of application to HRSA. Um, but we have health centers who are using it as part of their strategic planning process. Um, so a health center who identified five different communities um, for expansion. So he targeted a couple for new access point. Um, he targeted a couple for um, change in scope. Uh, some people use it for their community health needs assessments. Um, so we just have a wide variety of uses, but primarily it's for that service area mapping for application. Wonderful. Thank you. And I think you um, shared the link. Um, I do know that there are um, webinars also offered on UDS Mapper um, at different um, learning levels. Is that correct? Right. So our intro webinar is going to be on May 10th at 2 p.m. Eastern. Um, and then our next advanced webinar, I'm just looking at my calendar on my wall, um, is May 22nd um, at 11 o'clock Eastern. Um, so those are our upcoming ones, but they're all listed on the uh, UDS Mapper site in the webinar section, so you can look for them there and sign up um, from that page. Great. Thank you. And lastly, Brett Pope, um, I believe you mentioned that there was a publication that was going to be coming out. Um, so I, I don't know if you want to just make people aware of that again as well. Sure, yes. Um, so the uh, UDS report is basically um, just sort of a summary of all of the slides that you saw here today. Um, that document is currently under review with HRSA um, as we speak. So that should be made available uh, through the uh, National Healthcare for the Homeless Council's site, and we'll, we'll put out some um, blasts to make people aware of that once that's been approved uh, here in the next month. Great. Well, thank you today, and thank you for everybody joining us um, for today's webinar. Um, a link of the archived webinar will be available on our website at www.nhchc.org within a few days. Um, at the close of this meeting, an online survey to evaluate this webinar will automatically open your web browser. So please take a minute to um, complete that to help us improve your webinar experience. And we apologize again for any technical difficulties we might have had. Um, and on that note, the webinar is closed. So thank you.